the time for racial discrimination is over. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be the children of God. I see unfair taxes and government waste, and, and I see runaway spending. I'll never tell a lie. I'll never make a misleading statement. I'll never betray the confidence that any of you has in me. My name is Jimmy Carter, and I'm running for president. Jimmy Carter, the 39th president of the United States, rarely used his full name, James Earl Carter Jr. He thought it was too formal. He went on to become president of the United States, the first Georgian ever to be elected president. Like Abraham Lincoln, more than a century before him, Jimmy Carter lived the American dream, proving that a person from a modest background could attain the highest office in the land. I'm Samuel Logan at the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library and Museum. Jimmy Carter's journey to the nation's highest office began in the small Sumter County farming town of Plains, Georgia. Born October 1, 1924, President Carter grew up in the nearby community of Archery, where his father had a farm. He was the first child of James Earl Carter, a peanut farmer and grocery store manager, and Lillian Gordy Carter, a registered nurse. Later, two sisters, Gloria and Ruth, and a brother, Billy, joined the Carter family. Jimmy Carter grew up on a small farm in the southwestern part of Georgia, where his family struggled hard to make a living. He was the first in his family to finish high school, the first to graduate college. Peanut farming, talk of politics, and the devotion to the Baptist faith were mainstays of their rural upbringing. Jimmy attended public school in Plains and got good grades. When he wasn't in school, he worked on the family farm. He sold peanuts as a sideline and saved the money he earned. His childhood on the farm was full and enjoyable, he remembered, isolated but not lonely. He used to say he always had enough to eat, but no money to waste. The Carter family supported the Democratic political party. Jimmy's father, a conservative, never questioned the racial doctrine of the time, believing that African Americans were inferior to whites. Jimmy's mother, however, instilled in her son a more enlightened view of race, that all people are equal. Jimmy graduated from high school with very high marks and wanted to attend the U.S. Naval Academy, but there was little money in the family to pay for college. Jimmy's dream came true in 1942 when he received an appointment to attend the Naval Academy. He got good grace in college too and played several sports. He ran track and cross country and played on the academy's football team. When he graduated in 1946, he was in the upper 10% of his class and became a Naval officer. During his last year at the Naval Academy, he met Rosalind Smith, whose family also lived near Plains. Shortly after he left college, they were married. During his Naval duty, Jimmy Carter became a submariner, rising to the rank of Lieutenant. He was chosen by Admiral Hyman Rickover, the architect of America's nuclear submarine program, to learn all he could about reactor technology and nuclear physics. Then he served as senior officer of the Sea Wolf, America's second nuclear submarine. Jimmy Carter's naval career was challenging and exciting, but in 1953, his father died, and he decided to resign his naval commission. He returned to Plains with his wife, Rosalind, and their three sons, 
Jack, Jeff, and Chip. He took over his father's farm, where Jimmy and his sons worked the land. And Rosalind kept the books. But Jimmy Carter was not content to just be a peanut farmer. He also sold fertilizer and seeds to other farmers, and before long, built a profitable farm supply business. Jimmy Carter's career in public service began when he became a member of Sumter County's library and school boards. In 1962, he ran for the Georgia State Senate and won. Been uh, campaigning almost 18 hours a day without stopping for eight months. I've seen almost every... He lost his first race for governor in 1966, but ran again four years later, and he won. The time for racial discrimination is over. No poor, rural, weak, or a black person should ever have to bear the additional burden of being deprived of the opportunity of an education, a job, or simple justice. Perhaps his most important contribution as governor of Georgia was that he increased the efficiency of state government. I see unfair taxes and government waste, and, and I see runaway spending. During his four-year term, he reduced the number of state agencies from 300 to 22. He also continued his efforts to upgrade Georgia's weak educational system. We need to remember who pays the taxes and who pays our salaries. By the time he left the governor's office, he had appointed more women and minorities to important state jobs than all of his predecessors combined. I'm one of about 15 or 20 people in the country uh, who work actively in the Democratic Party who have been mentioned for a place on the ticket next year. Jimmy Carter's quest for the White House began in December of 1974. At the Democratic National Convention in 1976, he was nominated by the party to run for president. To accept your nomination. He chose Senator Walter F. Mondale of Minnesota as his vice president. Together, they campaigned hard against President Gerald R. Ford. He wanders, he wavers, he waffles, and he wiggles. B. Carter will say anything, anywhere to be president. You help me, I'll help you. Thank you very much. In the end, Carter and Mondale won the election by 297 electoral votes to President Ford's 241. When he became president on January 20th, 1977, he adopted a casual style. After the inauguration, the Carters chose to walk instead of ride to their new home in the White House. President Carter wanted people to think of him as just an ordinary person, so he often dressed casually and reduced the pomp and ceremony associated with most presidents. Many people welcomed this simple style, but others were critical of it. They felt it was less than presidential. Jimmy Carter inherited a country suffering from a poor economy, inflation, and high unemployment. The Arab oil producing nations had sharply reduced oil production, driving up gasoline prices and creating shortages. There's no way that I or anyone else in the government can solve our energy problems if you are not willing to help. President Carter dealt with the energy crisis by decontrolling domestic petroleum prices. He tried to strengthen the economy by deregulating the trucking and airline industries. He also sought to improve the environment. He tried to make government more efficient and responsive. And as he had done as governor of Georgia, he appointed record numbers of women, blacks, and Hispanics to government jobs. In foreign affairs, President Carter's goals were for peace, arms control, economic cooperation, and the advancement of human rights. 
His efforts toward peace in the Middle East were widely acclaimed. In the fall of 1978, the leaders of Egypt and Israel met with him at Camp David, Maryland, and agreed on basic principles for a peace treaty. A treaty was signed in 1979, but negotiations on details of the peace made slow progress. I'm so proud of both of you. God bless you both. <laughs> President Carter also concluded a treaty with Panama, giving that country control of the Panama Canal by the year 2000. Both of these treaties were controversial, but the U.S. Senate ratified them in 1978. President Carter also helped establish diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China in 1979. This house belongs to all Americans, people who are firmly dedicated to a world of friendship and peace. And Vice Premier Deng, on behalf of all Americans, I welcome you here to our house. And in June of that year, he signed a new strategic arms limitation treaty with the Soviet Union. But by the end of 1979, two issues arose that severely tested his leadership. In November, Iranian militants seized the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and held the Americans there hostage. One month later, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan to put down an anti-communist rebellion. To free the hostages in Iran, the president ordered military action, but the mission failed. In response to the Soviet action, he limited trade with the Soviets and called for a boycott of the 1980 Summer Olympic Games held in Moscow. But as President Carter faced re-election in 1980, the continuing plights of the hostages dominated the news. and continuing inflation at home stagnated the economy. Jimmy Carter's administration, a litany of despair, of broken promises, of sacred trusts, abandoned and forgotten. Jimmy Carter lost the 1980 election to his Republican challenger, Ronald Reagan, who won 489 electoral votes to Carter's 149. Even then, Mr. Carter continued the difficult negotiations to free the hostages. I just completed, on behalf of all the American people, one of the acts in my life which has been the most moving and gratifying. Well, here they are now. Is there any word about the hostages? Have they taken off? Iran finally released the 52 Americans on the very day Jimmy Carter left office. Once Jimmy Carter became a private citizen again, he embarked on a life as a humanitarian and diplomat. He helped monitor elections in developing nations, fostered peace talks in Somalia, and led a U.S. delegation to Haiti to help reinstate their elected president. To be back in Haiti, a country obviously dedicated to peace, human rights, and democracy. He made a historic trip to Cuba where he called on the United States to end its 40-year-old economic embargo against the island nation. Back at home, he established the Carter Center and the Jimmy Carter Library and Museum in Atlanta, and he worked for Habitat for Humanity, building houses for the poor. In 2001, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his lifetime dedication to finding peaceful solutions to international conflicts and for advancing democracy and human rights. When Jimmy Carter started his presidency, he boasted about being a Washington outsider who could streamline the federal government and solve the problems of a slow economy. His achievements were notable, but in an era of rising energy costs, mounting inflation, and continuing tensions abroad, it was impossible for him to meet those high expectations. Because he failed to win re-election, the Carter administration was perceived as being a failure. But Jimmy Carter, America's 39th president, 
left behind a lasting legacy of success in both domestic and international affairs.